please welcome the Otis Redding family. Come on up, Otis. Otis Jr. You get it? Or is it a tough one? All right. Zelma Redding, please. Dexter, Otis, Carla, have a seat. And then, Waka, why don't you come up as well? Okay. Well, first of all, on behalf of the museum and our members of the museum, Welcome to Los Angeles Thank and the you. Grammy Museum. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here and, and to see so many people here who um, are interested in seeing this wonderful exhibit that Waka has put together. And my family and, and, and friends, my dad's, so my aunts, I call them my dad's yeah, sisters, yeah. but my aunts, they're here. And friends who have traveled from here and far just to uh, be here with us. And most importantly, we appreciate you guys for supporting the legacy of Otis Redding for so many years. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, <laughs> may I ask his sisters to stand up? Yeah, can we get? Put a little, can give us a little, a little brightness little in the room. Who, who are we acknowledging here? Okay, here we go. There they are. <laughs> you know, there's so much to talk about when it comes to Otis Redding, and yet, he didn't live as long as we would have all loved him to live. First thing I want to ask, however, in that time, Zelma, how did you meet him? How did that courtship begin, and how far back in time does it go? <laughs> From a local teammate party. That's where we met. Uh, in, in Georgia? Yeah, in Georgia, at the Douglas Theater. So that's where he would perform on Saturday mornings, and it was for teenagers to come and hear uh, the disc jockeys have different uh, artists to come in, you know, that was starting to grow up and want to be in the business. So we met at Kind of like a talent show kind of yeah, thing? Yeah, that's what it was, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. Talent show. African American community and culture had lots of talent shows from the Apollo all over the place. Right. And there was some amazing talent because in Macon, it wasn't just Otis Redding. You had kind of like a whole all-star team of great soul singers. Right, you had uh, Otis Redding, James Brown, Little Richard, uh, which, you know, some of those guys. You can I just stop right there and that's <laughs> plenty, right? That's, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> so so tell, take us back to that day. What, what, what attracted you to him? How did the whole thing go? Did he, did he come to you? Did you go to him? How did it happen? No, I didn't go to him. All he right. came to me. <laughs> <laughs> And it wasn't real pretty um, <laughs> when he came in. <laughs> so um, we uh, we didn't meet on a good note, you know. Care to explain? It was a little or? arrogant, and, and I'm I'm a little arrogant too. So <laughs> it wasn't real pretty, but in but the in a week or so, it grew to be pretty. <laughs> How I, did that happen? I saw him again, and I said, "That's that same boy." No. <laughs> <laughs> And I didn't even know him. Uh, we didn't live in the same neighborhood. It wasn't far away, but I, I didn't know him, so that's how we met. Mm -hmm. And we fell in love. Yeah. Well, take us back. So this must be, what is this, the early 1950s thereabout? F 58. 50, okay, late 50s. What's making like at that time? This is just before the Civil Rights Movement. Things are just starting to percolate. What was it like? Well, it was different. I mean, we had our, um, it was racial and, you know, we had to ride on back of the bus and um, that was the only place that we had to go. Uh, it was the only black theater other than one that was on the other side of town, but that was the one that was owned by a black family who started that theater. So um, we had our problems, um, but we, 
you know, we struggled to overcome them. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And we still struggling yeah, to overcome them. So in, in making late 1950s, did you know this is, you know, James Brown was just starting to pop. People knew who James Brown, certainly Little Richard at that time. Right? Well, you know, everybody knew who James was and Little Richard, uh, you know, which Otis knew them better than I did because, uh, you know, I went in that circle. Um, but it was uh, Little Richard that I think I had met before I met James Brown mm -hmm. a long time ago. So it was really. As growing up um, in the South and back then in the, mu in the musical world, what did you guys, what kind of role did you play when, when you said your last name was Redding? I mean, that's a pretty powerful name in American soul music. W was there a, a, a desire on any of your parts to follow in Otis's shoes? Did you, what, what, how did that happen? Well, I was only three years old when my right. father passed away. Right. So um, as I grew up, you know, um, going to school, you know, following, go, I went to St. Peter Claver Catholic School and initially, you know, everybody knew that we were Otis Redding's kids, so we, we did have to deal with uh, the sitting on the Dock of the Bay song every day. And, <laughs> and, and, uh, and it seemed like that was the only one that they knew. Every, yeah. And, yeah. and um, <laughs> Dexter, you know, as we got older, you know, Dexter was already very musically inclined, and so I started, you know, trying to grab his guitar and stuff, and when we were in school, everybody automatically expected us to sing in the talent show. Right, <laughs> so right, right, right. And so did you? Of course, yeah. we did. We did. We I was playing. Uh, I was playing guitar at first when we had uh, when we started out, and uh, so I got frustrated because I could never finger the chords. Yeah. So Otis started playing guitar, uh -huh. and I started playing bass. So oh. you know, yeah. So so they were a great recording group from the late seventies to the early eighties. Um, the Reddings had a great time with, with another member, Mark Lockett. Um, and I was very jealous because I didn't inherit any of that musical talent. <laughs> <laughs> and all I wanted to do, and, and I still have it, and all I wanted to do was to play the tambourine and they wouldn't let me. I had to go to school. So, so but I was very lucky that um, my brothers were um, following in my dad's footsteps and when I was at Georgia Southern but University. But boy, is she good at taking care of business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I take care of business. But being that means Georgia she's a Southern member of the band then. That's, That's right. right. Yeah, That's I am a member. Hidden member. Yeah. Right. Uh, but One uh, good thing about it, m my mom, she never pushed us to do like never, never. anything, like just whatever you want to do. So we all decided, Otis and I, to just go in it ourselves, you know, and, um, and it really turned out to be a good thing for, for us. Well, Dexter had his first rec record deal when he was 12. 12, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. On the Capricorn, on Capricorn label. Capricorn. Yeah, on Capricorn. Yeah. Bill Walden's, Bill Walden's yeah. label. Yeah. That's right, right, right. So what, what was that like? It was fun. Yeah. I, you know, I was having fun at 12 years yeah, old. I bet so. you were. <laughs> 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 I was just excited to have a day. I had a song called uh, Love, Love is, is Bigger Than Baseball, baseball <laughs> and the flip side was God Bless. <laughs> yeah, but it was, you know, I, I was 12 years That's old, right. and it did good overseas, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Almost like Otis Reddy, right? Yeah, right. That's right. That's where. That's, that's where true. He's Which still we'll talk picture. about in, in, in yeah. just a second. So, Waka, you, of course, as you said before, you're not of our generation, and you basically you curate this. What did you learn about Otis Redding? What what moves you most about his story as a, as a curator? I mean, the, the time period of his career, the length of his career, I think, was really what shocked me the most. You know, I, just going in, or just even before working here, you think Otis Redding, and I was thinking, you know, this long career, and it's like he had such an impact in this five-year period. I mean, and not that he wasn't singing forever, but to major mainstream success. And to learn how, you know, his overseas successes, we're talking about the Live in Europe tour. I, I mean, just his impact and how people accepted and loved him. And what shocked me the most and what I was excited to learn about was when he came to Los Angeles and the time when, I can't wait to meet Miss Deborah. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's like, you know, when he comes to Los Angeles, he lived on Manhattan Street. That's near where I live now. So I was really <laughs> excited when I learned that information and the Los Angeles connection. So that was a great thing. And the Whiskey A Go-Go and 
performing at the Hollywood Bowl at, for the American Braille Institute. It's like those things are so local to us here in Los Angeles. And I think it's just, that was really, just his impact in such a short amount of time was something that was amazing. Selma, when, when he starts to basically make a career going beyond the local talent shows, right? What happens? How does that happen? How does he get from being just this kid who's on Saturday mornings and you get to see him to someone who's now making records and beginning to make a name for himself? Well, um, after I met him at the talent show and, you know, we start dating, he came to Los Angeles yep. and uh, was with his family out here and his uncle and his sisters. So his career kind of started. That's when, you know, he worked around and he met people in the business and they start uh, recording out here. And he did um, These Arms of Mine, uh, uh, start writing it, came back to Stax and recorded it. Then he had another song he had did it locally in Macon, shot Bama Lama. So the career just was from here to there and to back back to Macon. Right. Mm -hmm. But he stayed out here about nine months, yeah. mm -hmm. about nine or ten months mm -hmm. before he came back. And but he was still, you know, trying to get a record deal right, right. and uh, pursue his career. Yeah. You know, one of the interesting things that I was reminded of watching Walker do the exhibit was, and it's in the introductory notes, is he did it all. You know, he wrote the songs, he sang them, led the band, the whole, but there weren't a whole lot of people who were writing songs, except his, his heroes, people like Sam Cooke and James Brown and right. those people, Ray Charles, but there was a whole slew, particularly of white artists at the time, prior to the Beatles, that were relying on other people to write their material, exactly. right? But not in the, uh, this African-American soul community, it was do it all yourself, or as much of it as you possibly can. And he could pretty much do it all. Well, and he did. And one thing I tell my kids, uh, there would be more songs in his catalog, but he worked so hard when he started, um, his career took off. So that didn't give him a lot of time right. to just sit down and write. Right. So he would cover a lot of songs, but and what I mean, and I know the artists, I mean, the audience know what I mean when I say cover, the, cover a lot of songs. He did a lot of songs that other people, right. but he also mastered those songs and made them, he owned those songs himself. He didn't write them, but they were so different, so great the way he produced them. And, uh, right. uh, and one of the great them. ones, Satisfaction. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Oof. You know, it, yeah, the Stones did Satisfaction, it was great but Otis made it his song, gave it a completely different point of view. That's right, yeah. uh, he, did, he and one of his really big idols was Sam Cooke, yeah. so he covered a lot of, yeah. you know, yeah. the tunes. T talk about the, maybe the, the, the children, if you could, talk about his influences. You know, I mentioned Sam, we, you mentioned Sam Cooke, I mentioned Sam Ch Cooke, we mentioned James Brown, how could you not, right? From Macon, but also James was James. Um, Ray Charles was in there to a certain degree and others, but how did he, can you explain how he took those influences and then incorporated those influences into his own style? Because the Otis Redding vocal style and performance style was quite different. He didn't jump around and have the super moves of James Brown. He did it another no. way. Can we ex explain he, that? He did it all from the heart. Uh, well, well I, I feel like um, I had a the chance to to talk to Richard Penham to talk yeah. to little Richard a lot and he would he would be the first one to tell me well you know Otis your daddy wanted to sing like me <laughs> and, I, and uh, I'm like really well tell me why, why you say that and he says well Otis you we, I want you to listen to your daddy and on the end of them words he say he 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 he, he got that from me Otis <laughs> I said, okay, and I listen to it, <laughs> and I and I do hear, you know, and I can, he's he's a bit older than my dad, and I think my dad probably really did look up to him and yeah. and um, phrase like him, but then he put his own twist to it, and that raspy yeah. 454 yeah. engine yeah. voice. And just, <laughs> just, uh, just really you know, get just take control. Yeah. And yeah. Just if he did a song, um, the most amazing thing to me is, um, when I was, you know, not old enough to know any better, I, I said I would hear Tri Little Tenderness and I'd be like, yeah, that's my daddy's song. And then as I got older, I realized he didn't write the song. Right. Yeah. And I listened to, to the original 
uh, some of the early early versions of the song and then I listened to his version and I was like this is just totally amazing the way he can take a song and rearrange it and just completely yeah. own the song yeah. 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 and it's because there's like so many of, of you all we growing up had to really learn our dad I mean we we pretty much had to learn just like you all did I mean we knew the songs and we knew the legacy and we knew we were Otis Redding's kids and you better act right. Um, <laughs> but, but most importantly, we didn't know how huge he was. We just kind of were humble to be his kids, mm -hmm. but we didn't quite understand the impact that he had on the world. And right. we had to kind of learn that as we, and we're still learning, you know, we're, we're st we still walk in and, and experience people who say, do you know I met your dad and he was this and, and it's just powerful to hear those stories that we never grow tired of. You know, you, you mentioned, Otis, uh, how he could take a song like Try a Little Tender, make it his own, or Satisfaction. But the reverse happened too, right? The most famous, Respect, right? right. Most people know Respect, unless you're African American and you, you heard the early version, <laughs> Otis's version, everyone, we all, I learned it from Aretha. Right? Right, right. So, I mean, it happened the other way around, too, because most people today, if they don't really know, they think Aretha wrote the song. And, right. then, and she did a good thing, which was she claimed it by her version and made it such. And I always thought, too, that when she, her version came out, you know, I, we know what the song was about, but in 1967, 68, it was about a lot more than that. You know, as, right. as the whole civil rights thing, is black power thing is pushing forward, then it meant something even more. I, I, I wonder, you know, had Otis lived, what he would have thought of, how anthemic that song ultimately became. Do you remember him writing it? Do you remember anything about it, Selma? I, I remember him writing it, and I remember a friend, of, well, a, a very good friend of, of his that worked for him, you know, and the conversation started really strange one day at, um, at our home, and um, he was, ha the, 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 the employee was having trouble with his wife, and uh, so Otis was like, man, I, I can't put up with no woman doing all that crazy mess. <laughs> he said, so the person that I'm speaking about, he just said, well, all I want is a little respect when, when I come home. And that's all he had to say. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say too much around Otis Reddy, because you're going to hear it again. <laughs> but it's going to be in a whole different form, I promise you that. So that's, that's basically how that started, as well as dreams, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, dreams to remember, mm -hmm. uh, which I co-wrote, mm -hmm. you know, and it was just- How did that happen? He, did he was away in Europe and I was just missing him so much. And um, I was, it was about one o'clock and I just wrote this little poem. So when he came home, I said, I wrote a little poem in it. You could make it a song. He said, you know, look, <laughs> You're not a songwriter. You take care of my kids. That's what you do. <laughs> okay. That's <laughs> why you can see my little porn. <laughs> so, so that, and I never knew he recorded until he died. No kidding. Yeah. Wow. 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 Do you have a favorite where you could say, this song, man, that's my dad. I love this song. This song is so him. I mean, obviously, you didn't know him so well, but is there one that just you hold closest it's to your heart? Too difficult. To, tonight, I was walking around, and there was a, I went in this restaurant to eat the O yeah. Hotel, and every single song that came on was, I guess it was Pandora Otis, it was an Otis song, and I was like, maybe that's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> no, Dreams is my favorite one, but it's, the catalog is just so vast. Yeah. It's, it's just so hard to have a favorite. Yeah. But Love Man, I think, is my favorite one. Yeah. Only because I, I think it, it just describes who people, who my mom, and everyone tells me who he was, and that's what he was, a love man. Mm -hmm. Six feet, one weight, 210 pounds. Mm -hmm. You know, so that that's my favorite. Yeah, he was a Hulk, one. kind of. I mean, he's yeah, a, he's a big guy. <laughs> yeah, guy. Big guy. he looked like an yeah. athlete. Yeah. When we think about um, maybe the most famous thing that occurs in his career that totally sets him apart, other than Dock of the Bay, which we'll talk about a little bit, was the Monterey Pop Festival, because that changes everything. I mean, he explained to a whole generation of white kids 
on the West Coast in particular, that this music existed. Because out here, or growing up on the West Coast, you didn't have the deep soul experience, even though there were a lot of African Americans who would come to Los Angeles, Oakland, places, but not to the extent in Chicago or Detroit or New York, Newark, places like that. So Monterey Pop comes, and all of a sudden, Otis Redding just changes. One of the great scenes, if you guys don't remember, if you've not seen the movie or not seen it in a long time, just remember, isn't it, isn't it Mama Cass who's just sitting there just going, just yeah, like that yeah, during Otis's, yeah. I mean, it's just, they were absolutely blown away. He went out there and he played, I think it was 99.9% .9 white audience, yeah. not knowing how he was gonna go with all this hippie music. It was Janis Joplin, Grateful Dead, uh, all these great artists from California primarily. And he goes out there, and of course Hendrix was there as well, there was others, but man, everyone remembered that. Did you remember getting news from that show? Do you remember anything about hearing about that? Uh, I remember him flying back that you know that next morning and you know he 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 just felt so great about it um, because you know he said I reached a whole new audience and he knew it he, he knew that and uh, and he did yeah. and it was you know shortly after you know he didn't live to right. see right. Uh, what had really happened but uh, the growth was going to get bigger yeah. and he enjoyed it a lot, yeah, yeah. but he was so excited when he got back. Yeah, yeah. Walker, when in doing the exhibit, you know, there were some other records. You you mentioned the live in Europe, and we didn't mention a whole lot about Europe, but he goes over to Europe and does the same thing for crowds over there as well. Talk a little bit about that. I mean, just, you know, from my research and talking, you know, to the family and, and understanding a little bit more, exactly the same thing, what happened at you can look at the whiskey, which, you know, the whiskey is only two years old by the time, you know, Otis Redding is performing there. And that's a stage where the birds are playing and you have the doors, the, the doors, Jeff Buffalo Campbell. Springfield coming on and all of these people. And now you have Otis Redding and the same thing. Please. I want to hear more. I want to hear more. And that's actually the soundtrack that we have playing in the exhibit and love the outtakes that you left. Yeah in that album because you can hear the people sing satisfaction yeah. <laughs> sing this sing that and you can hear the people and i love that about that album but it's just the impact that he had i mean you're not you're no longer he's no longer performing in the you know those southern circuits on those tours now you're performing on this huge stage and right. now you have today where you see i mean those things planted the seeds for a Justin Timberlake to be singing sitting on the dock of the bay or Jay-Z and Kanye doing Otis. I mean, yeah. you know, and kids who don't know right. who Otis is and they're just thinking that's Jay-Z and Kanye yeah. song. <laughs> it's like, oh no, that's Otis Ray. <laughs> so I mean I think that those those performances, yeah. Europe, whiskey, all of these Hollywood things, Bowl. Hollywood Bowl, all of these great performances, Monterey Pop, mm -hmm. are planting the seeds right. for these people to to reflect on and celebrate today, I think. Those live performances give us, or, or me personally, such a close connection to him and, and how he was on stage. It was, I mean, I, I can actually feel like I'm in a concert mm -hmm. when I hear those, those live performances, particularly Monterey. Mm -hmm. I'll play it over and over and over again and mom will say, will you turn it <laughs> off? Because <laughs> he gets all out of breath and he's singing fast and she's like, he's out of breath you needed to slow down, just turn it off. <laughs> now just hit repeat again. So, so those things, you know, that are, that are left for, for me are very special yeah, yeah. because I get to experience almost like a concert yeah. that yeah. he was. You know, one thing we need to touch on as well is Otis recorded for Stax, right? And, and Stax, of course, for those of you, and I know many of you know this, but you know, it was Motown up north in Detroit, and there was Stax in Memphis. And the interesting thing, there was always this, this comparison. I don't know about competition, perhaps, but certainly a comparison where Motown, which occurs a little bit earlier, and able to reach white audiences quicker with the Supremes and Little Stevie Wonder and so many of them really hitting the pop charts starting around 1964. And then it's really Otis taking the lead for the Stax artist that allows people like Wilson Pickett and Eddie Floyd and Carla Thomas, and they had some early hits too, but he is, he becomes really the poster boy for, for Stax records. And wow. the cool thing about Stax records was in one of the most racially uh, segregated towns in, throughout the entire South, there was 
an integrated band there. And a, one of the right. great bands of all time with Duck Dunn, Donald Duck Dunn, Steve Cropper, Al Jackson, Booker T, you know, Green Onions and so much more that they did. And Otis was at the forefront of that. And I remember reading a, way, a long time ago that when he died, the whole, the whole stack's heartbeat just kind of went away. First of all, it was a shock, obviously. But right. you know, without him being there to present them music, it, it lost yeah. a lot of steps. How do you guys feel about that? Well, you know, I was I was talking I was talking to I think Aaron uh, today, and the, we were talking about the Sax Museum, and and when you walk in, it's all Otis Redding. You yeah. go in and you you see the video footage, and it's the beginning of Otis Redding, the middle of Otis Redding, the end of Otis yeah. Redding, and then it's almost like the life is gone. That's right. Of it. That's right. Um, so you know, it's it's amazing how he held all of that together. Um, and then for it to just kind of dissipate, yeah. you know, once, once he What died. Carl is talking about is there's a museum that if you're ever in Memphis you need to go to. It's the Sachs Sachs Museum. Sachs they do great Sachs. education programs, yes. terrific mm -hmm. stuff, Sachs. and yeah. they are well worth the opportunity for you to go and explore Stacks and, and done right at the Stacks oh, studio. Yes, it absolutely. was in a theater, and that's where that exhibit is, yeah. it's, it, uh, where the museum is. So make sure that goes on your, your bucket list for music museums. I don't want to take too much time because I want the audience to be able to ask you some questions if they will. But obviously, after Monterey, which happens in June of 1967, and then we come to the fall, he, he's doing fantastic, and he goes into the recording studio and he cuts Sitting on the Dock of the Bay, which was completely different than anything, to my knowledge, that he had done at least publicly in terms of music. This was slow down, introspective, quiet, almost like folk soul, you know, folk music com uh, connected to soul music. When you first heard that song, Zelma, what did you think? Where did that come from? Uh, when I first heard it, it was so different when, you know, and I went in, the, we went in, the kids and I went in the studio uh, when, when he recorded it. He wrote it in Sausalito, uh, San Francisco. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it was so different, I said, why are, you, why are you changing your style? He said, well, you know, I think I need to change because I, I plead and I beg and, you know, I'm so gutsy. I'm, I'm going to change my style. And I said, well, this is really different. I, I don't know about this. So, um, you know, that was the one thing that he said he was going to do. And we don't know how far he would have gone with yeah. that, you know. We just know it was, um, I often think, I said, I, I tell my kids, I said, do you think Dock of the Bay would be as big as it is today? And when he died, if the, right. if mm -hmm. it, it, it just yeah. felt like he was telling you a story. Right. You know, I'm, I'm not going to be here, so I'm going to leave you with this. Right. Yeah, and there are even some, if I'm not, if I recall correctly, there's some, lines of lyric that are pretty, whoa, it's yeah. like, you yeah. know, almost like he had a premonition or right, something. Right, right, and, and yeah. you know, I often think about that, and, you know, and I, I think maybe, maybe not, you know, yeah. um, but it's a great song. Yeah, you know, the song is so great that sometimes I get a little frustrated with because it's, you know, when you have a song that great, it's kind of like the only thing Particularly younger people, people, they know. know it's the only one. And, right. and they think that's it, that's yeah. the style. And then when they hear some of the other stuff, they go, whoa, it's yeah. just the opposite reaction, right? Yeah, that so, happened a yeah. lot. Yeah. I mean, even yeah. with older people, and they, they, yeah. you know, they say, uh, Otis Redding, Doc of the Bay. I said, well, he did more in Doc of the Bay. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. <laughs> but that's yeah. what they yeah. recognize. Yeah, you exactly. Know? Which and was a Grammy Award winning song. Right. You know, that's right. a great, great song. And then, of course, the tragedy of it all was. This new idea, this new concept, no one had done that kind of music before, anxious to hear some more, right. and then the tragedy then the occurs. Tragedy not, to, not to bring up some very, I'm sure, still open wounds for you, but for the record, so we have it here in our archives, how does it happen? What do, you, do you hear it? How do you hear it? I just hear it as a song that's gone, it, it has no end. Right. I mean, the music, Otis Redding music to me, Dock of the Bay, is just timeless. You know, um, it'll be where if a young kid don't know anything, they if you teach them, if they hear Doc of the Bay, 
they're going to know. Yeah. They're going to love remember it. that. It's that kind of song. It's that kind of yeah. song because yeah. it's just timeless. Yeah. And then just a few days later. He was gone. He was gone. Where were you when you hear the news? How does it happen? I was at home uh, with the kids. Uh, we had spoke early, uh, like 7.30. And uh, Otis was three, as he was. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he wanted to talk to all the kids. And I said, well, you know, nobody's up. But we call him Junior. But it's <laughs> he's Otis the third, really. <laughs> and uh, he spoke with him. And uh, he said, well, we, you know, we're getting ready to go. And uh, the pilot knocked on the door. They was in Madison, get, getting ready to go to Madison. And uh, he said, I, I'll call you when I get there. And um, never, did. never did. Somebody else called. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. You know, plane back then weren't so kind to popular music, right? Buddy Holly and Richie yeah, Valens yeah. and others. And and but go ahead. Excuse me, yeah. that, but that was his second plane. And, yeah. and of course, uh, I don't think it was a problem with just the pilot, or I think it was the weather was really bad. Yeah. And, uh, you know, everybody think, well, Otis Redden, that was his second plane. I mean, I didn't know about the first one right. <laughs> until I, you know, I. He wouldn't tell me because he knew I was just going to go crazy about all this, you know, planes and yeah, yeah. in the air and all this stuff. I uh, would worry myself sick. But uh, the weather was really bad. Yeah. And they probably shouldn't have left. Yeah. Uh, but that was like the second or third day he had ever missed out of his career. Wow. Wow. Just I think, Mom, you said that that was his, that was his thing. He he got he's not gonna disappoint an audience. Mm -mm. He gotta Never. make that date, you know. So, right. you know, he had no fear, from what I've learned. No, from he had there no was fear. no fear. Yeah. I read maybe, correctly or not, did he want to become a pilot? Was he taking yes, flying he, lessons? I mean, he didn't want to fly the plane, but right. he 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 wanted to take flying lessons. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But he had his, his you know, we, we had a pilot. Yeah, yeah. And of course, we had flew in that particular plane. Yeah, yeah. Flew to yeah. Memphis. Yeah. And did Dr. Bay and, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. great plane. Yeah. So now, uh, obviously, you're all, he had this wonderful farm that he would come home to. He's on the road all the time, a oh. lot of one-nighters, but he comes back and there's a, a sense of stability there, a family. And basically, you're the, you're the caretaker, not only back then raising the kids, but since his passing, you're still there, aren't you? I'm still there. Yeah. And yeah. don't blame on going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and, and close by, everybody live on the farm? or yeah, I, uh, Dexter yeah. lives right on the lake, and then I'm a house over from, from Dexter. So uh -huh. My uncle lives is right at the driveway. <laughs> the city slicker lives in Macon. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> he lives like a city but, slicker, right? But you can best believe I make my way to the you country yeah, right. every he's all, day. He's in Round Oak every day. He's there every day. day. So. <laughs> that blow up, <laughs> blowing the yard. On the track. So this is like really glam for us because when we're at home, it's sweats and no makeup and <laughs> tennis shoes that have red mud. And uh, But we love it because uh, that's the way we grew up. That's, yeah. that's the yeah. way we grew up. It's fun. We were so fortunate to be able to grow up in an environment like that because, yeah. you know, we would bring our kids, we'd, we'd bring our friends. We said, we're going to come and visit us at the ranch. And they're like, well, how far is it? Well, it's about... 30 minutes, <laughs> and we ride by yeah. some trailers, because on our road, there's just a yeah. mixed right. use of, of homes and things. So, And I'd say, the country. that's our house right there. It'd be a trailer. They're like, really? <laughs> <laughs> but then we get down the driveway, and they, they'd see our ranch. And um, my and dad was so ahead of his time yeah. Uh, yeah. to even want to invest in property and furnishings. And that. So it's 300 acres? 300. Well, wow. 400. 400. 400, 400, 400 yeah. now yeah. since yeah. mom acquired yeah. some more. Yeah. So. And he's buried there. And he's buried there. And it's not in the back part. It's no. in the front. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually said to my mom, I said, Mom, who gave you permission to bury him there? She said, I didn't need permission from anybody. <laughs> do what I want to do with him. So. <laughs> Taking him so home. Anyway, right. yeah. So, so he's there. He's at the ranch. Yeah. And so, so the, basically, the legacy is still there. 
as we're doing here with the, at the Grammy Museum, trying to let more people know about it. But when you look back at the times, and all, all of you, if you would, just comment, you know, the legacy, and do you feel as a Reading a responsibility to carry on the legacy? Does it sometimes become a burden? Oh, Reading, is your dad, was your dad? I mean, how, how do you guys deal with it on a daily basis? No, it's, <laughs> I don't think it's never a burden. I mean, it's, it is what it is, you know? Um, that's the way it is. We, only thing we have to do is, is hold our standards up, you know, and keep everything going, and, and keep his name alive, and that's what we do, you know? Every day. Uh, that's what we live to do every day. You know, it's, it's really no burden at all. It's absolutely an, an honor, honor yeah. to be the children of Otis Redding because he's so well respected. There's nothing negative ever about Otis Redding as we travel from here to far. Um, and through the foundation, the Otis Redding Foundation, we make sure that our kids, that we, the lives that we touch, that they know who Otis Redding was and how he took care of his business and how he took care of his family. And uh, so it's absolutely an honor. Well, being Miss Otis Redding at 24 and still Mrs. Otis Redding at 73, that ought to tell you. That ought to say something. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mrs. Otis Redding, I want to thank you for coming all the way to Los Angeles. How about a hand for the Redding family? We have a few minutes left. I'm going to turn up the lights a little bit and see if we got some questions, okay? Anybody have a question? Yes, sir. Gina, it's such a thrill for me to have you all here talking about the man who has had a profound in impact on my life. Um, he had such a prolific career for a very short amount of time, record, wrote and record, recorded hundreds of songs. Is there any <coughs> recorded material, whether live or in the studio, that has not been released yet that could? To answer your question, uh, there is some, but um, it was not quite finished the way that it should be, and um, the record companies just won't give him the disrespect of doing that. So that's, you know, because it just seemed like when you just throw anything out on the legend like Otis Redding, that you're just trying to scrape the barrel, and we don't, we don't want to do it. such a beautiful family. I don't think anything could represent Otis's legacy better than just this beautiful group together like this. Thank I just you. wanted to say that. Wow. Thank, Thank you. you. And, we're to and we are together every single day. Every, every single day. day. Every day <laughs> we're together. I just wanted to, wanted to ask, uh, Otis recorded a lot with Carla Thomas. Do you, do you keep in touch with her? Any, any thoughts on that? Well, I only keep in touch hear from her through a great friend of mine who started the Stax Academy, Dina Parker. Um, Carla had, had, you know, she, she had her problems, uh, like some of the artists back in the time do today. Yeah. But uh, she's hanging in there, but not, you know, not very well, I understand. Any other questions? Right here. Yeah. Thank you. We <laughs> bring you guys here because this music needs to be shared with the world. Yes, it's okay. incumbent upon us to bring more people here and do the same. So my question is, uh, what what would you account for the large popularity of his music in Europe or overseas? Good question. I think it, I think um, you know the the whole Northern Soul thing. Back in the, from what I've read, and I get to travel abroad and go over there. I I really get to go there and work, and it's. It's a great feeling. They just appreciated soul music so much more because I don't know if it was because there was uh, the you know the Motown thing going on and some other things, you know that kind of maybe you know made it over here that they were more in competition. But uh, Stax just was what it was all about. Is f they just ruled soul music, Sam and Dave, Otis Redding, mm -hmm. and uh, the whole Northern Soul thing over there, it, it has just never died. It's mm -hmm. just, it's still big. It's a really Even big thing, and they today. really appreciate it. Yeah. They still really today, appreciate it. You know, yeah. I think my dad is far more appreciated 
uh, on the international waters. And I can't forget Eddie Floyd. My and father's course, really Eddie good Floyd, friend. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the, the Europeans, and it's almost sad to say, like you said, but they seem to appreciate jazz, blues. I mean, where most of our bluesmen and women make their money and, and get keep their career going, but in Europe, during all the festivals during the summertime, it's not, doesn't seem right, doesn't seem fair, and I don't have the answer to it, but I do know, and I hats off to the Europeans for yeah. keeping a lot of, and respecting it in a way that is truly admirable. They, yeah. they really do love the music and the artists who make it. Right. Yeah. Yes, in the back. Yeah, I was fortunate enough to see your dad a couple of times in Houston when I was young. Wow. 66 and 67. And the first time I saw him was at a nightclub in Houston. They didn't get to introduce your fiddle. <laughs> All right. I always thought that was like a really great song. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like? What was, what was it, it like? Oh, what, what was it? Like? Oh, what was it like when he wrote it? Uh -huh, like, the the idea. Yeah. It, well, you know, um, he was in the hospital once. Um, and he had some problems. He used to ride so much in the cars, and he just had, you know, going through some problems. And, and he was in surgery. And um, I said, um, if you don't get back out on the road, and then he was producing Arthur Conley, which was taking up a lot of his time. <laughs> and I said, they're going to forget about you. He said, no, nah, they'll just call me Mr. Pitiful. <laughs> That's how it came. <laughs> Yeah, he always had an answer for everything. That he said. <laughs> Which and eventually turned into a song. It turned into a song. You just you have to watch. Otis Redding was one person. If you say something and it was catchy, next time you're gonna hear it, it might be a hit record. <laughs> <laughs> don't harm. Don't repeat too much. If you want it. <laughs> yes, sir. No, uh, um, it was just the song that, you know, came up, I guess, because he did so much writing in the studio, and a lot of times I didn't know, you know, till I could, was like the, the average fan or that he recorded it, you know, because I wasn't there. Sometime I would get to go, so I don't know. And then, you know, then it was pitched in for the use in Pretty in Pink. And, you Which know. we get a lot of those. We're very yeah. fortunate that we still do. You know, we have a great team of people who consistently pitch the catalog for commercials and great movies, mm -hmm. and so it's 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 still really relevant. And it's so great. Television it's so shows. Reward. Television shows. Ellen does respect often on her show. Yeah. So, yeah, so we're very Over here. Yes. No, I don't think so. Passed a little bit after his time. Right. I met him, but uh, I don't think Otis did. That's a really powerful, powerful performance, that Sweet Otis. It's like it's they just meet afterwards. Whew, it yeah. is. It is. They met through the music. Right. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else <laughs> over here? And then we'll get. No, not at this time. We're still working on that, most of it, you know. Uh, back in the day, you know, publishing and all that could get to be very complicated. But we have a great team, and we have a great team of management that we're working with and uh, and lawyers that we work and with. Publishing. And publishing. Uh, so we uh, some we do, some we don't. Way in the back, yes, there you are.
Well, you know, really, he he was driving uh, a, a very friend of his to Sax to record. And, the, I mean, they didn't know him. Uh, he was not the person that they was interested in. He was taking Johnny Jenkins to record. And uh, when they finished, he asked, could he record these songs of mine? So when he called and said, I have a record deal, what, what was well, he well, when he after that, I mean, he had they didn't sign him right away, uh, but the record kind of lingered around for like nine months, and yeah. finally, uh, this jockey in Nashville uh, played it and played it, and it began to catch on, and that's how his career started, because he had some before the end. Shot Bama Lama was yeah. it was a decent song, but it just didn't make it. And Johnny Jenkins, just so we know, guitar, pl Jenkins, guitar player. Guitar player. Yeah, not Jenkins, the same kind of style, but but certainly and a great guitar player. Right. And Matter of fact, Hendrix even together. is influenced but, by him. That's right. Yeah. Right, but he was just driving him down yeah. Yeah. because Johnny wouldn't. He didn't drive. He wouldn't fly. He he wasn't gonna get there. <laughs> and didn't. <laughs> so a couple was, more questions. Hold on. Someone else said, "Yeah, good." Carlos. Do you guys have any um, just memories that you used to cherish? I know you guys were young, but is there anything that you, you guys used to cherish that's like any? Yes. Uh, I remember one time we was coming from a show with my dad, <laughs> and Otis came back. Um, we got off the plane, so he comes home with one shoe. <laughs> one shoe, and, and, and when we hit the door, my mom <laughs> said, Where's his shoes? He come back. He was <laughs> so he he comes back with one shoe, and it was like it, it, it was kind of crazy. That was like know? the last trip. Yeah, that was the last. And not trip ever that going again. Ever, yeah. I can I can actually remember that. I was a busy busy kid, <laughs> very busy kid, and busy. And every every day now, when I go in my daddy's room, I do something for my mom. I I, I still think about it. Um, I was. Probably about two and a half, mm -hmm. almost That's three, true. and yeah. he had the cassette recorder, you know, the cassette player. He'd be in there playing his guitar and writing songs, and he took his attention away from it for a minute and went out of the room, and I took the cassette tape, and I thought that it would be best for me to take the cassette, the tape out of the tape and see how far I could string it from that side of the room <laughs> to and that I side. And I told him, I <laughs> warned him, I said, Junior, you're going to be in big trouble <laughs> for touching that. And... uh I got a little pop. <laughs> <laughs> I wet my pants and I told him he was crazy. <laughs> so my mama tells me I did. So I know I did it. Nobody ever uh, would do what I was doing. No, 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 no. But my, my favorite memory is we would always get ice cream. Whenever he was home, the first thing from the plane to the car was straight to Baskin Robbins to get ice cream. Oh. And he loved all of the flavors. We would, <laughs> we would stand in there for hours just tasting and sampling all of the flavors. So that's probably why I don't like ice cream today. <laughs> Not ice cream person. <laughs> One or two more. Yes, sir, in the back. Well, you show Kurt. Kurt. Have you ever asked your wife for film or television? Not, not that I know of. Uh, he was going to work with other artists like Etta James. Mm -hmm. I know he was going to work with her. And, you know, Don Kobe, they worked together. And, you know, that's just kind of where they were in that time frame. Uh, you know, working with each other, producing. I mean, was stopped in uh, New York from, from, from Europe. And uh, he would call, and, and I said, well, where are you now? And he said, well, I'm, I'm, in, that, I'm in New York. I'm at Atlantic, and I'm working with Ada Jane. He, they would call her Big Red. And... Uh, I said, well, how long are you going to be working with Big Red? You need to get on Jamaica now. <laughs> you don't need to be fooling around in, 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 in New York. you just coming from Europe. You need to get home. Big Red can look out for herself. <laughs> it was always humor in my house, you know. He always said, well, my wife is crazy. She's just crazy. And he was producing, didn't you say, before Arthur Conley? Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sweet soul music. You guys know that. Yeah. Great classic. Yeah. That went gold. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Let's take one more. Way in the back. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, this is the 75th uh, anniversary of his birth. Is there, are you doing anything special to oh, celebrate yeah. that? 
Absolutely we are. Uh, we're having a huge celebration, which it takes up a whole weekend um, in Macon, Georgia. Macon, Georgia celebrates 75 years of Otis Redding, right. which starts September 9th and goes all the way through the 11th, uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, mm -hmm. with Saturday being the Evening of Respect tribute concert with, of course, Dexter and Otis performing with other musical celebrity guests. And it's a major fundraiser for the Otis Redding Foundation and for our music and education programs. Nice, nice. Yeah. Nice. So. That's great. Well, on behalf of the members, the museum, Waka, myself, thank you so much for sharing these ideas, thank you so remembrances, much. just your soul, and, and you guys are doing great work. You have a great legacy to, to keep up, and the Grammy Museum is only too honored to help you do that. So thanks again. Thank you. All right. I'm going to wait for my brother Dex to come back. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Mm -hmm. I guess I'll start without him, and he'll come and join me. Do a song. My mom's never heard me do this song, so I'm gonna send this one out to my mom, okay? I was the sun way up there. I'd go with love most everywhere. I'll be the moon mm -hmm. the sun goes down. Just to let you know my love is around. Cause that's how strong my love is. Oh, that's how strong my love is. Cause that's how strong my love is. Oh, cause that's how strong my love is. Be the weeping willow drowning in my tears. You can go swimming when you're here. I'll be the rainbow when your tears are gone. Wrap you in my colors, keep you warm. That's how strong my love is. Oh, that's how strong my love is. That's how strong my love is. Oh, that's how strong my love is. I'll be the ocean so deep and wide. Catch all your tears. Whenever you cry, oh yeah, I'll be the breeze when the storm is gone. And dry your eyes, and love you forevermore. That's how strong my love is. Oh, that's how strong my love is, baby. That's how strong my love is. Oh, that's how strong my love is. Yeah. I got. Holding you tight 
Nobody knows what I feel inside. All I know that I walked away and cried. I got dreams, dreams to remember. Listen to me, baby. Yeah, I got dreams. Got dreams, dreams. Got dreams to remember. Oh yeah. I know you said he was just a friend, but I saw you kiss him again and again. Yeah. These eyes of mine, they don't fool me. Why did he hold so gently? I got dreams, dreams to remember. Listen to me, baby. I got dreams, got dreams, dreams to remember. Oh yeah, I got. Still, I want you to stay. I still love you anyway. Why did he ever want to leave, girl? You just satisfy me. Ooh wee, yeah, dream. Dreams to remember. I got dreams, dreams to remember. I got dreams, I got dreams, dreams to remember. I got dreams, dreams to remember. I got dreams, got dreams, dreams to remember. Thank you. No, you know, this is a sing along with Everybody, put your hands together. Sitting in the morning sun, I'll be sitting till the evening comes. I'm watching the ships rolling. Then I watch him roll away again, yeah. I'm sitting on the dock of the bay, watching the tide roll away. Ooh, I'm sitting on the dock of the bay. I'm wasting time. I love my home in Georgia, headed for the Frisco Bay. Cause I have nothing to live for, and look like nothing's gonna come my way. So I'm just sitting on the dock of the bay, watching the tide high. Roll away, ooh -wee. I'm sitting on the dock of the bay. I'm wasting time. Ah, ah. It look like nothing's gonna change. Everything still remains the same. I can't do what. Ten people tells me to do, so I guess I'll remain the same. I'm sitting here 
testing my bone and this loneliness won't leave me alone it's two thousand miles i roam just to make this dock my home now i'm just a sitting at the dock of the bay watching the tide roll away Ooh -wee. I'm sitting on the dock of the bay I'm wasting time everybody do the whistle for me oh yeah Can we do it one more time? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Much respect. Thank you. Thank you. How about a hand for the Reddings, everyone?